I can't tell you whether or not to buy stocks now generally. I think it's important that you save money, you know, and whether you put it in the stock market or not, it, uh, I don't think is terribly important. I think if you're interested in stocks, you should buy them, you know, and you've got a little capital, you should buy a few. I mean, I don't think there's any way of learning about them better than experiencing it. Doing it on paper isn't the same. I can guarantee you, if you lose money on paper or lose real money, it's a different experience. And uh, uh, so I, I think you'll learn more about yourself if you do it that way. I bought my first stock when I was 11. Actually, I was at Rose Hill at the time, and I bought three shares of City Service Preferred at, at uh, 38, and it went down to 27, which is something I still remember even though I was 11 at the time. Uh, and then it went up to 40, and I sold it. I made five bucks on my three shares after commissions, and then it went to 200 and something. So, uh, you know, I probably remember that a little better than if I'd been doing it on paper. You know, you know, and, I fooled around doing a lot of things between about age 11 and 19 in the stock market. I did charts, I did all kinds of technical analysis, I read every book I could get on the subject. And I didn't do that well, I didn't do terrible, but, but I, I, did, I was really just floundering around. But that meant by the age of 19, when I read Ben Graham's book, I was at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, I went and bought this book called The Intelligent Investor, just come out, and it had an enormous impact on me. Now if I hadn't done in the previous eight years, if I hadn't been all over the lot, I'm not so sure that that book would have had the same impact on me. I mean, I was, by that time, I was prepared to read Ben Graham's book, which changed my life financially in an incredible way. I mean, it, I wouldn't be up here today if I hadn't read that book. But part of life is getting prepared so that when something does happen that's significant, you can grasp the significance of it and know what to do with it. And I would say that first eight years of fooling around, even though it produced nothing financially to speak of, uh, produced a lot in terms of getting my mind prepared for when I really did read something that made sense. So I was ready to accept it. And I actually went back and went to Columbia to study under the under Graham and because of, of reading that book and all kinds of things flowed out of it. So I would encourage you, if you're interested in the field, to do a few things. I'd still try to make them as intelligent as possible. I would try to stick with things, businesses I thought I understood. I'd still get out that sheet of paper and I'd write, I'm doing this because, and just test my reasoning. And then I'd go back and read it a year later and, and see whether what you thought would be true turned out to be true. So I would always check myself. I believe in grading myself on everything. You know, doctors have postmortems and they, they do it because they learn from postmortems. Uh, in business, people don't like to do postmortems. I can be on the board of a company and they can building plants or buying companies and they never want two years later to run a check on how that decision turned out because it, it can be unpleasant. But you learn from postmortems. And uh, you don't want to learn, it's way better to learn from other people's mistakes than your own, but you got to learn from a few of your own too. And uh, the time to do it is when you're young. I think that the country as a whole is quite well prepared for the future. That doesn't mean I would adopt every policy they have. But I think, A, we have an enormously rich society, enormously rich society, and it'll get richer. Everyone isn't going to participate in that. Some won't participate because of physical disabilities, others because of mental disabilities, others because of shortcomings in the education they received when they were growing up, all kinds of reasons. We have a prosperous enough society to be able to take care of, of, of those people, and we should take care of them. And how we do it so that they feel most useful in life, and how we do it so that we continue to encourage people to be more productive themselves and all that. I mean, those are not easy questions, but that shouldn't take our eye off the ball of feeling we should do something about it. it uh, I pose this problem sometimes to people. I say, let's assume that it's 24 hours before you're born. And all of you can take this test, 24 hours before you're born. And the genie comes to you. And the genie says, Joe, says you look pretty promising to me. I think you've got kind of a sense of fair play and, and a good mind. And so I'm gonna let you have an extraordinary opportunity. I'm going to let you design the world into which you're going to be born in 24 hours. It's yours. You pick out the political rules, you pick out the economic rules, you pick out the social rules, you design the world. And when you're born in 24 hours, you're going to be born into that world. And that's the world that's going to exist for your lifetime, for your children's lifetime, for your grandchildren's lifetime. And you, having heard of some of these genie jokes in the past, would say, What's the catch? And Janie said, well, it's a very slight catch. I said, when, when you're born in 24 hours, 
you're going to emerge in this world you designed. But what you don't know is whether you're going to be born black or white, male or female, rich or poor, bright or retarded, able-bodied or infirm, in the United States or Afghanistan. All you know is that you're going to reach into this barrel, which now has six billion balls, as we know, representing one person, every person in the world. And you're going to participate in what I call the ovarian lottery. You're going to take one ball out of that barrel and you're never going to get another ball. That's you. You're going to get one ball and now you're going to merge. Now, what kind of rules do you want to have for that society, not knowing which ball you're going to get? Now that I put to you is the way I think people should think about social policy. And if you're born, if you're lucky enough to be born in this country, you've won the lottery already. But we should have a system, in my view, that encourages the Jack Welches and the Bill Gateses and all of that to work far beyond the time when it has any economic significance to them. We want people commanding those resources who are extremely able at commanding them. That's how the, how the standard of living moves forward. So we should want you know, we should want Tom Osborne coaching in Nebraska. We should want we should want Bill Gates designing software, and we don't want to mix up those two. We don't want to, we don't want we don't want to get Bill coaching in Nebraska. Uh, so you want people you want a system that directs gets people to their potential and and puts them in the position where they can do the most good for society. But you also want a system for the people who get the wrong ball. I mean, somebody's going to get the ball, you know, that says ADIQ. Somebody's going to get the ball that says this disease or that disease early in life that cripples them. And we've got a rich enough society that we can we can take care of those people. And I think that I think that this society will move more and more in that direction. It has the capability of moving more and more in that direction as our resources uh, and our output increases. And I think that it has the will to do that in a general way, although like I say, there have always been lots of fits and starts. So there is no shortage in the United States of resources. There's no shortage of output. You have to have a system that encourages people to behave to the limit of their abilities and puts them in the right place. But then you have to make sure that everybody gets taken care of too. Investment means laying out money now to get more money later on. And how sure are you of getting that money later on? And if you feel more certain because you know more about the game in real estate than in stocks, then I advise you to stick to your circle of competence is in real estate more than stocks. I mean, you ought to go into the game you know the best. But it gets down to predicting the income stream from the asset and comparing it to the present price. I mean, that's true if you buy oil royalties, it's true any kind of investment. I would say that if you're in a period of those 40 years where inflation averages two or to three percent in what I would call sort of normal, you don't have any huge aberrations in the world on a macro scale. I would say that the average business will produce over that period something like 7%. But investors, that's what if nobody did anything, if we just all here sat and bought corporate America together, bought every share, and we never traded with each other, our group, I think, would average something like 7% in that environment where nothing really dramatically changed. Now, because American investors have been taught to think they have to move around all the time. And you have to sell to the person next to you and they have to sell to somebody else. Investors incur what I call frictional costs. You incur them when you buy a mutual fund, there's a management fee, perhaps in a load and a 12B1 fee. You incur, you incur them when you buy stocks individually. There's all kinds of frictional costs in the system. Those frictional costs, probably for investors as a whole, come to something like 1% annually. Uh, you can keep them down yourself. The frictional cost of somebody owns his own Berkshire for 40 years has been virtually zilch. They paid a tiny commission one time and, and management fees are low. So it doesn't have to be that way. But because stocks are looked at so much like being in a casino for so many people, the American public as a whole will incur these 1% frictional costs. So that 7%, if that happens to be the figure correctly, will turn into 6% for the American public as a whole and 1% will dribble away to investment managers and brokers and people who sell advice and all, all kinds of frictional costs. When you think about it, that's a pretty hefty take. One out of seven would be 14% of the returns from business. But that's my best guess as to what will happen. You can keep your own frictional costs down and let somebody else 
pay a lot more of the frictional cost. But if you're in an investment, if you're playing in an investment arena and you are incurring frictional cost of two or three percent, think of what the day traders were incurring, you know. But you're giving away an awful lot of the underlying business results that America will achieve. Because General Motors or Exxon, you know, American Telephone, how much they earn has got nothing to do with how much all their shareholders incur if they keep changing chairs all the time. Every time you change shares with somebody in this room, we own the whole place, you both pay something. If you just sit tight, the companies will make the money that they make and that will all belong to you. But if you move around a lot, it will belong to the people who either advise you to move around or shepherd you from one chair to another. Over a long period of time, markets will behave pretty much like they've always behaved. Most of the time, they will be valuing businesses in a reasonable range and they will go crazy periodically on the upside and downside. In 1974, they went totally crazy on the downside. I mean, you can't believe how cheap major businesses got in the period like 74. Businesses were doing fine. The Washington Post Company sold in the market, the whole company, for $80 million. It owned the Washington Post newspaper, it owned Newsweek, it owned four great big network television stations, including one in Washington, and one in Miami, one in Jacksonville, one in Hartford. It had, Half interest in Bowater Mercy paper, 800,000 acres of timberland in that. Third interest in the International Herald Tribune. Didn't owe any money to speak of. $80 million. It's a joke. At that time, you could have announced that you were going to hold an auction of their properties in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at two in the morning, you know, and you would have had people show up who would have paid at least $500 million for those same properties. Now imagine buying $500 million worth of properties, good businesses, for $80 million. You know, in this world, all these people with high IQs around, studying finance at major business schools, all kinds of things, one-fifth or one-sixth what the business is worth. The Graham family was obviously both honest and talented. They were in good businesses. Well, that company today, with no, they haven't discovered oil, they've got the, pretty much the same businesses. You know, it is it's now selling for seven billion or thereabouts. And, but there's nothing mad, they haven't discovered anything. You know, it was a five hundred million dollar business that became a seven billion dollar business over a thirty year period, with good management, decent properties and all of that. And you could have bought it for eighty million. You know, we we own at Berkshire some Washington Post stock that we paid ten million dollars less than ten million dollars for, and which is now worth a billion two or something of the sort. And it was nothing esoteric about it at all. It's just people go crazy. And if you ask me about the financial markets of the future, I will absolutely confidently predict. I just don't know when, and I don't know what order. I don't know whether people will get greedy before they get fearful or <laughs> vice versa. But over the next 30 or 40 years, you'll see some incredible aberrations. And you have to be able to think independently at that time. The US market, there's 13 or 14 trillion of equities. You know, it's probably close to half the world's market. So you don't really need the rest of the world to look at. I mean, when you own Coca-Cola, you're having well over two thirds of your earnings coming from outside the United States, same way with Gillette and all of that. So if you want to expand your universe, there's nothing wrong with it, but you can, the United States will do well over the next 30 or 40 years.